discretion, used nine times in nine verses of the Bible, the act of sound and right judgment before God and men. There is no such thing as a holy war unless the one who is holy is waging it, who on this planet is perfectly holy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry, and you're watching the weekend edition of the Quick Study Television program. Look, we're talking about Isaiah, and today we're going to be focusing on Messiah's war. Now, the Bible says that there is no one holy except God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Only Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is that perfect one. We'll talk about it coming up in just a moment. Corey is here with Bible History and Archaeology. Today we are looking at the archaeological remains of the life of a man that Isaiah names. All right, Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? Today we're wrapping up our series on exoplanets, and in this last report we're exploring the possibility of a completely naturalistic formation of these extrasolar planets. All of this and more coming your way. Stay there as the Quick Study Weekend Edition continues. Let's look now at Isaiah chapter 49. Now there are a few people and officials, historical officials that Isaiah the prophet mentions in passing and very specifically as well within the text of the book of Isaiah. One of these individuals is Shebna, a servant of King Hezekiah. In Isaiah chapter 22, Isaiah prophesied against Shebna, who held the position of steward in charge of the house. Shebna was in trouble because of his pride. Apparently, he had built himself a rock-cut tomb somewhere high in a hill or mountain and had paraded around in extravagant chariots. It was said that he would lose his job as servant over the palace and that Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, would take his place. Indeed, when 2 Kings chapter 18 lists the court officials of Hezekiah, it lists Eliakim as in charge of the palace and the demoted Shebna as court secretary. In the 1870s, Charles Claremont Gonneau excavated an ancient tomb carved into the rock of a cliff face that overlooked the ancient city of David. In it, he found an inscription that he sent to the British Museum, but it wasn't translated until over 80 years later. After translation and being dated to the time of Hezekiah, the inscription has almost universally been accepted as belonging to Shebna. This tomb is likely the one that got him chastised by Isaiah. But that's not all. Two seal impressions have been found that preserve a full version of Shebna's name, Shebna Yahu. The first was found at Lachish. It was labeled a mystery because it was missing a chunk that would have held Shebna's position in the royal court. But a second impression was bought in 2007 that was identified as coming from the same seal. This time, a piece of the missing word was preserved and it identifies the owner of the seal as a servant of the king, meaning an official. So, not only do we have two impressions from Shebna's seal, we also have his boastful rock-cut tomb. In 
It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible and they're all around us. We're looking at Isaiah 49 at 51, specifically in 49. Now the wise guy Isaiah utters a profound mystery 700 years before it happens. That's a real prophet. And this is called a prophecy. Now the Hebrew word comes from the word prophet. That is prophecy comes from prophet, which in the original language means one who speaks not with his own words, but with the words of God. Interestingly enough, the word prophet, navi, comes from a root word, which means to bubble over. So here is the idea that a prophet has. A prophet in his prophecy bubbles over with words from heaven. So Isaiah chapter 49 is a prophecy of Messiah's job description. That is what I call Messiah's war. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him, for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them. Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 10. You're watching the Quick Study Television Program Week Edition. My name is Rod Hembry. Thank you for joining us. You know, you hear a lot today about, uh, you know, various terrorists and various ideologies saying, well, this is a holy war. One person's attack is another person's holy war. We search history and we see the horrible atrocities that the Christian church did to the Jews for 1,700 years in the name of holy war. And it's absolutely wrong. It's an absolute atrocity. And as you look at history, you realize how many people manipulated, tried to manipulate and corral God and his ideas upon their side, his energy. Let me just say at the beginning that the only war that's holy is one led by the Holy One. There is none, repeat and hear me carefully, there is none on planet Earth who is holy except Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah calls him the Holy One of Israel over 20 times in his book. 
Only Jesus is holy. Now, there will be a holy war. Look to Revelation chapter 19 for the details of that. But I want to get into this because I want you to understand what Messiah's war really is so we can remove all of this rhetoric that we're hearing in today's world about what God really wants. Listen by Isaiah 41, verses 1 through 5. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. This is Jesus, the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. His quiver has hidden me, and he has said to me, You are my servant, O Israel and in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vain. Yet surely, just as my reward is with the Lord and my work with my God, and now the Lord says, who formed me out of the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him, for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. This is a messianic psalm of Jesus with his life, death, and resurrection on the cross. Messiah's war, if you would, is to rescue people. And so Messiah's war, number one, is to bring Jacob, those beloved people, Israel, whom I love, back to God. God has not discarded Israel and replaced it with the church. If you want to quote me on that, I want to say this again so you can understand my position. God has not replaced Israel with the church. Uh, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible after reading the Bible through 29 times. Now in verse chapter, uh, or verse 6 of chapter 49, it goes on to say, Indeed, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore and to preserve ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. This is the work of Christ to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Messiah's war is to bring the end of the earth back to one true God, the ends of the earth, everybody back to the one true God. Now look here, a light for all nations, not a judgment for all nations, a light for all nations. God is not willing that any perish. He wants all nations to come to God and to holiness and to rightness and to justice. Finally, we go in verse 7. We have to continue. Lots of scripture, but we have to continue. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to him whom man despises. Sounds like Jesus. To him whom the nation abhors, the servant of the rulers, Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. And he has chosen you, thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. And I will preserve you, and I will give you as a covenant, hallelujah, to the people. Jesus is a covenant to the people to restore the earth to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. God's going to, his name is Redeemer. He's going to redeem all a mess. Praise God. That you may see, or say rather to the prisoner, go forth. And to those who are in darkness, show yourselves, come into the light. They shall feed along the roads with their pastures. They shall be, in, uh, be on all the desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun will strike them. For he who has mercy upon them will lead them. Even by the springs of the water, he will guide them. This, beloved, this is Messiah's war. This is Yeshua HaMashiach's job description. Right here in Isaiah 49. You could go to 61 as well. But here is the final point I want to leave with you. Messiah's war is to completely destroy the horrible oppression of evil and its consequences. You know, one of the greatest things that, that, uh, I, that just makes me thrilled and I, I just love it, that evil, sickness, disease, death, starvation, all these evil things, injustice, crime, violations, abuse, sexual abuse, all this is going to come to an end and be reconciled. Sin is finite. It doesn't continue on forever. When you have a biblical worldview, you understand that time is not forever. You realize there is accountability, there is sin, and it really changes the way you think about life. And hallelujah, our hope in Jesus Christ is that he's going to cut off sin one day because that 
is Messiah's War. A very famous and influential city in the ancient Middle East was the city of Tyre. Now Tyre is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, also Ezekiel and some other prophecies as well. But right now we're going to focus in on this ancient city. The city of Tyre lies within the boundaries of the land promised to ancient Israel. Within the different time periods represented by the Bible, the name Tyre would have had slightly different meanings. The city was originally built on an island a few hundred yards off of the mainland, a perfect port city. It was supplied with food and water by a coastal city directly opposite it, known as Ushu or Paleotyrus. During the time of the judges, this island city is what was known as Tyre. Later, the city on the mainland came under Tyrrhenian control and also became known as Tyre. History tells us that Tyre was renowned for the production of purple dye extracted from snails indigenous to the area. The Bible records arrangements between King David, King Solomon, and Tyre, in which Tyre provided materials and specialty craftsmen. The city of Tyre also appears not so favorably in biblical prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 23, the prophecies against Tyre speak openly of its role as a port city and of its ties to Sidon well established in history. Isaiah's prophecies may refer to the confrontations Tyre had with Assyria, or they may be looking farther ahead to the 13-year siege of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Ezekiel 26 specifically mentions Nebuchadnezzar as part of Tyre's judgment, and yet it also prophesies beyond him. Nebuchadnezzar's besiegement did force the island city into submission, but it wouldn't be for nearly three centuries until Alexander the Great would fulfill Ezekiel's words. I will scrape the soil from her and turn her into a bare rock. Alexander had his army build a land bridge out to the island using the ruins of the coastal city. And then he took the island. Study TV needs your help this summer. We're looking for viewers to partner with us by becoming regular giving members of the Quick Study support team. A gift in any amount on a regular basis will help us tremendously. If you as a viewer see any value in this program, would you consider giving an offering in any amount now to help us continue broadcasting every day in every way right here? Our address is P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, it's P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also give online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. You know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament are his handiwork. This is Psalm chapter 19. So he also says in Genesis that the stars and the moon and the sun are for the signs of the times. Here to help us understand more about that is Ryan Hembree with Cosmic Mysteries. Well, all throughout July, we've been studying extrasolar planets or exoplanets for short. These are planets which are outside of our solar system. Well, with all the hype going on in the media over the last several years, I felt it was important to find out the truth about all of this. In this fourth and final part, we're going to observe these exoplanets and try to explain their existence using the common naturalistic model of the Big Bang. NASA and many other teams around the world believe in a completely naturalistic origin of the universe where evolution is responsible for all life. These teams have set out to affirm evolution with the discovery of exoplanets. But in trying to affirm evolution, the exoplanets have actually caused more confusion to the theory of a natural origin of the universe. 
NASA believes that all solar systems were formed out of a cloud of gas and dust via the Big Bang. There are many scientific problems with stars and planets forming from a cloud of gas and dust, however. One main problem is that the hypothetical gas and dust disk would dissipate too fast to form planets of the size we are observing. Many of the exoplanets discovered are extremely large. Another big problem is something called migration. Many of the exoplanets that have been discovered orbit in extremely close proximities to their star, some even closer than Mercury is to our own Sun. At these extremely hot temperatures, it would be impossible for many of the materials to condense and pull together by gravity. In fact, we find some planets actually losing their material to the star. In an attempt to save their naturalistic models of the universe, evolutionists came up with the idea of orbit migration. In this scenario, a planet forms far away from its star, and then gradually its orbit moves in. This would allow cooler temperatures for the planet to form. Then, due to the friction from the dust disk slowing the planet, its orbit would shrink, thus giving the planet the position we see it in now. This orbit migration theory does have difficulties, though. For example, the disk of dust would dissipate before the planet could grow large enough or before it could come to its observed position. How could the dust disk last long enough to move these planets from their formation point several astronomical units to their resting points we see today? To put perspective on the distances we are talking about here, one astronomical unit, abbreviated AU, is the mean distance from the center of the Earth to the center of the Sun. One AU is 149.6 million kilometers. Another problem with the natural solar system formation surfaced recently when a new technique was developed to determine an exoplanet's orbital tilt in relation to the equator of its star. Some exoplanets have large orbital slants, some of even more than 80 degrees. It has also been discovered that many of the exoplanets have retrograde orbits, meaning orbits in the reverse direction of its star spin. This is a problem because the naturalistic model cannot account for the retrograde or slanted orbits. The planets are supposed to get their momentum from the dust disk that it formed from. So this means that the planet's orbits should be in the same plane as the equator of its star, and that it should rotate in the same direction as the star's rotation. There is no conceivable way that a dust disk could form a planet with a retrograde orbit or with a slanted orbit of 80 degrees. Naturalist astronomers realize that this is a major problem, so they suggest that perhaps there were one or more planets, or even stars that were also at highly inclined orbits. These extra planets and stars could possibly cause some complex orbital changes, but where did these extra planets and stars come from? And could this unlikely process have happened for all the different cases of retrograde planets? A big problem with this theory is astronomers do not and cannot observe this. Exoplanets have created even more problems for evolutionists. Not only has no life been found, but these planets have created even more questions. Using the Bible to discern these discoveries, we can realize that God spent the majority of the creation week setting up the Earth for life, and that it would be extremely unlikely to find life anywhere else. We also see the creative hand of God in the many diversities we see in these exoplanets. What's ironic here is that NASA and teams all around the world were so excited to find exoplanets because for them it was a new chance at finding life in outer space, and a chance to affirm evolution. But the, but the discovery of these exoplanets has actually done just the opposite. It's hurt their naturalistic ideas and forced them to add modifiers to their models. These planets are best explained by the handiwork of a creator. Uh, let's, let's make sure that we understand what we mean when we're talking about naturalistic ideas. We're talking about a universe where there's no God, doesn't exist. Uh, there's no causer, there's no design, it's just a chaotic mess and somehow we all burst forth from this. And then there is the actual God of the universe world model, which comes in from the biblical worldview of God created, the designer. And so that's what we're talking about here, the difference between the two. And so you've just heard an interesting element there where exoplanets were thought to push the cause of no God ended up going the other way. Corey, one of the things that always struck me kind of strange is with the Big Bang model, they, they say there was nothing and then there was an explosion. Yes. It doesn't really seem to make sense. I've, in, my, in my personal experience, I've never ever experienced or seen a, a, a testable model in which there is literally nothing. Nothing doesn't even really exist in our world. So um, <laughs> the theoretical nature of this is astounding. And the fact that it's toted as experimental observable science just doesn't make sense. It's theoretical. Well, who, who observed, if it's observable, observable science in the scientific method, then I just need to meet somebody who observed the Big Bang. 
Uh, that's all I need to meet is somebody who observed that didn't observe the cosmic end of the universe, the background radiation, but who obs actually observed the moment when that happened. And it, it's the nobody's alive who did that or in the past. Here's call to prayer. Holy war is a term that has been used as a national vice for manipulation by religions and history, including Christianity. Unless it is Messiah's war, it is not a holy war. Only the Holy One can conduct a holy war. When men use their religion to try to justify their political or military gain, God is watching. There will be an accounting at the end of time for all of history and the makers of it. God is not a citizen of any nation, but the Lord is the over all of creation. God's wisdom is at work in us when we are more concerned about becoming holy before the Lord than waging any kind of holy war on man. With that we pray, Lord teach me to respect your word and to avoid my own personal pride. Going through the book of Proverbs as well as the Bible here on Quick Study Television, guess what? We are in this amazing place, Proverbs 17 in verse 26, where it says, also to punish the righteous is not good, nor to strike princes for their uprightness. Now here the Bible tells us something very important, very interesting. It says that when you take that which is good and punish it, there is going to be a problem in the spiritual realm. You are going to be accountable for it. And so those governments that have made illegal the Bible, 57 of them, all members of the UN, and those governments who are willfully killing the 165,000 a year Christians because they won't recant their faith, there's going to be an accountability someday. And so I want to encourage you to understand that. But if you repent and ask God to help you, then he can give you forgiveness of sin for offenses. Only Jesus can do that. And I encourage you to come to Christ today and say, Jesus, I need some forgiveness. Help me, pray, call out to him, and he will answer. Thank you for watching Quick Study today. Remember, we are supported by people just like you. If you would like to join us and become a member of the Quick Study support team, write or call today. Thank you for your generous support.